going to talk about is basically about the fisher. And the fisher, which is basically a weasel, it's a mid-sized carnivore, no bigger than a large, large house cat. And it's related to wolverines or marns, which are other species that many of you may be familiar with. And even though it is a fisher, even the name doesn't, it conjures up something that basically goes out fishing. And that's not really the case for this particular species. Essentially, it has a wide breadth of prey items, but that, and that includes rodents, uh, rabbits, even deer carcasses, nuts, berries, and acorns. And the fisher, which may be surprising to some of you here in this audience, actually lives here outside in your backyard. So we have fishers here in the Sierra National Forest and within Yosemite National Park. And basically their range extends from the, the border of Yosemite National Park all the way down to Sequoia Kings Canyon. But they're very isolated because they live in these remote forests where old growth or mid-stage cereal forests are there. And there's expected to be no more than 300 individuals within this small isolated population. So think about that less than 300 individuals in a small isolated population. But that makes them then vulnerable to a wide array of different threats. And some of these threats, which are actually a growing problem, not just for the fisher, but also for our public lands. So first off, I'd like to introduce you to a quote from the late Rachel Carson in her wonderful book, Silent Spring, where she essentially states that we urgently need an end to the sugar coating of unpalatable facts. And the public must decide whether it wishes to continue on this present road, and it can do so only when in full possession of the facts. With that stated, what I'm going to uh, talk about is basically a lot of different unpalatable facts, but these are scientific facts. And therefore, we as a public must decide, even though the topic of this clandestine activity is emotionally charged and can be highly sensationalized within communities or within the media, we must make sound decisions based off of sound science, even though they may be unpalatable. So now, marijuana cultivation. It's kind of a head scratcher to a lot of folks is, how can this actually be a threat to conservation? Myself, I live behind the Emerald Curtain, or the Emerald Triangle. So in Humboldt, Trinity, and Mendocino, there's a lot of marijuana cultivating up there. So for us, we don't have these common assumptions, but for many folks outside of this growing curtain, there's this, this image that basically everybody, it's just a mom and pop. It's old hippies growing in the hills. It's an old timer sitting on his porch, smoking a pipe and sipping on his iced tea or lemonade and just watching plants grow. And they're all organically grown. And finally, and it's just a plant, man. Nothing really needs to happen except sun and water. That may be the case for some, but the majority of marijuana that is being cultivated in our great state and here locally is not the case. And it poses a risk to conservation in our ecosystems. So the next issue is why California? Marijuana can grow pretty much anywhere. And why are we focusing our research, or why is the focus on this particular state? Well, it is estimated that 60 to 70% of the domestic product, so marijuana that's cultivated in the United States, originates from California. That's a risk when we have large tracts of public or tribal lands. So when you have cultivators that are then trespassing on our public lands or trespassing on sovereign nations, so Native Americans, their, uh, their sovereign lands, it poses a risk because now it's the natural resources exploitation that may occur. We're also home right behind Hawaii to the second largest number of threatened endangered species that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Now, naturally, not each and every species under the ESA are going to be impacted by this, but a major majority of them are, and either themselves directly or indirectly by their habitats being exploited. And finally, cultivation conflicts with numerous groups. So you have bird watchers, hunters, fishermen, and then you also have individuals that are camping, recreating, mountain bikers. So these conflicts are just, they're not in the mission for the agencies that are stewarding our public lands. They're not on the mission also to the individuals, such as 
Native Americans on their sovereign lands. Back to the fisher. So the next question is, why are we focusing on the fisher? Well, the reason is, is because the fisher became the canary in the coal mine. Essentially, it became the flagship species waving its hand saying, we have a problem, we have a problem, and we need to deal with this as soon as possible because if it's affecting me, it may be affecting numerous other species. So how did we set off and how did the fisher become essentially the flagship species for this topic? It came back back in 2004 when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service deemed the fisher as a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And with that, it built up research and some support for that, and they wanted to investigate potential threats to the species, which one of them would be, what were the causes of mortality? So what was killing fishers? Were predators? Were vehicular strikes? Were diseases? So we sat off, myself and many other collaborators sought off to go ahead and address these questions. And when we started looking at this, we started finding an issue. And it, be, and it happened essentially in 2009, where we had a fisher that died. And it looked like a perfectly healthy, intact fisher. This fisher also died less than a mile away from the Yosemite boundary. In fact, this fisher's territory, where it lived its life, encompassed some of the Yosemite National Park. So when we did a necropsy on this fisher, we were investigating, just like, similar to an autopsy that is conducted on a human, what was the cause of death? What killed this fisher, this perfectly healthy fisher that looks like nothing, nothing could have happened to it? And what we found was anticoagulant rodenticides, or rat poison. That was the cause of death for this fisher. Earlier, when I was discussing about the life history for a fisher, this remote forest of a rare forest carnivore, how did anticoagulant rodenticide come to play a role in this fisher's death? So we started, again, it's a head scratcher. We started to investigate. We wanted to see if the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, private timber companies, campers, even private inholdings within the forest, were they distributing? And that wasn't the answer. We couldn't find the source point. And we exhausted and we found dead end after dead end until one day at a conference, a group of law enforcement officials approached me and basically stated, we think we know your source. And it's actually the trespass cultivation that's been occurring on our public lands for years. And that may be actually, and it's actually been escalating, and we're very worried about that. Can you come and investigate and see if that is your potential source? So naturally, as a scientist, we wanted to look at each and every possibility. So we did. We sought off to investigate this, and we worked with law enforcement to look and see if what they were stating was actually scientifically and factually true. So what we found, as you can see here, is we found rodenticides, pounds and pounds of rodenticides intertwined with food caches. We wanted to see if fishers were interacting with this, so we put cameras up. And what we found was fishers in these same campsites with all this rodenticide. And then campsite after campsite, like this one, what we found again, what popped up was fishers. And not just fishers, other species that were also interacting with this food and this rodenticide, like the sow and her cubs. So as you can see, the fisher became that canary in the coal mine, stating, we have an issue, we have a problem. Now, what does marijuana cultivation look like on our public lands? Many folks don't actively seek and to see what they look like because we know it's a clandestine activity and it's a safety issue. But this is what it looks like in a small scale in a manner. So, thousand plants or less, we consider these the clandestine small mom and pop grows. But you can clearly see it's littered with a whole bunch of plants and it's in a riparian area smack dab right in the middle of critical habitat, not just for fishers, but with the northern spotted owls and other species of conservation concern. And toxicants, when we go to these small growth sites, we find the same recipe, toxicants, toxicants on top of more toxicants. And then we find large growth sites so you can see this big, huge blob, which looks like a Christmas tree farm. This is in an 80,000 plant grow within the wilderness setting. And in this wilderness setting, that's just one plot of 10,000 plants. But again, toxicants and toxicants. So what is a fisher that is interacting with a toxicant look like? And as you can see, is what happens when a fisher actually comes across a grow site. 
with a whole bunch of toxicants. So this is an unanesthetized, a non-drugged fisher. It can't walk. It's a taxic. It means it's wobbling in coordination. And therefore, it's vulnerable to other forms of mortality, like predation. And so therefore, we, again, it's solidified that this is a risk. And we had to euthanize this fisher to end its long, potentially prolonged suffering and, and an inevitable death. So we published a paper to illustrate what we were finding out. And we, in this paper, what we basically documented was exposure and poisoning of this rare carnivore. And a lot of the research was right here in the Sierra National Forest and, and within some of the fishers that lived in the national park. And we found where that four fishers died from rodenticide poisoning. We had 79% of our fishers that were being exposed and at a rate of 1.6 different rodenticides on board. That means that's more than one rodenticide per fisher with upwards of five different rodenticides in this paper we found in one fisher. We found also a kit that was being exposed. So this is a kit that was 100% dependent on its mother's milk. Therefore, it either was exposed from its mother's milk or in utero. Day one, when that fisher was born, it already had the odds against them. Next paper, what were insecticides and rodenticides doing to the survival of fishers? And again, solidifying the correlation, were, were marijuana cultivation sites really the source points? So what we found was the average, the fisher here in the Sierra National Forest had an average of 5.3 different growth sites within its territory. And if you were exposed to rodenticide, you have an average of four, and if you weren't exposed, it was 0.6. So you can see that stark difference with one fissure actually having 16 different growth sites. Imagine having 16 growth sites laden with toxicants in your home range and you're trying to raise kits within that area. Now, how extensive is this threat in California? So here you can see is Sierra National Forest and Sequoia National Forest. These are sites that have been cleaned up by a local volunteer group, the High Sierra Volunteer Trails Group that was founded by the late Shane Krogan. And basically here is all the sites that were cleaned up. And in this clip is basically going to illustrate the sites that are occurring within the state of California. So you can see year after year, hundreds upon hundreds of sites that are compounding their footprint. These are just public land and tribal land grows. So this is what the state of California looks like with just five years of growth sites on public and tribal lands. And now, is law enforcement detecting each and every one of them? Unfortunately not. Only 30 to 50% of those are being detected. So imagine, this is a significant underestimate. And it's not because law enforcement lacks the enthusiasm to detect it, they lack the support for them to go detect. Now, how many of these sites are cleaned up? Only 10 to 20% each year of these sites are cleaned up. That's about an 80 to 90% of these sites are still there, leaving potentially a legacy effect because there is essentially a lack of support for this. It's grant by grant and private donations. And bear in mind, hear this, grant by grant and private donors are actively seeking to help clean back our forest. There's no steady stream of support. Now, is this getting better? Here's all this information, all these talks, all this dissemination. Is it getting better? And unfortunately, we just published a paper this month where we showed in just three years of data, from 2012 to 14, eight more fishers that died. Exposure went up from 79 to 85%, 6% increase, with 1.7 per uh, different types of rodenticides per fisher. We had one fisher that actually had six different rodenticides. Imagine that, six different rodenticides. And poisoning per year for fishers jumped. So what we had was, for the California fishers we were monitoring, an average death rate was at 5.6% from rat poison. It's jumped to 18.7%. That's a 233% increase. Now, does this go beyond fishers? Barred owls are a surrogate species for fishers, and 56% of those have been exposed. We have exposed invertebrates. We have contaminated water, soil, native plants, and marijuana plants are now contaminated. And we have contaminated game species. So now it's a one health approach. It's not just affecting just 
wildlife, terrestrial, avian, or fisheries, it's now potentially affecting humans that live downstream from these grows. So this final video essentially is going to show you what happens with the grow site. But remember, it's not all doom and gloom. There's actually a concerted effort by volunteers that are going and working with National Guard and law enforcement to clean up these sites, taking back our forests one site at a time. Even though the funding is limited, but this is what happens with a community and law enforcement partnership. And people don't see law enforcement doing this often, or the National Guard donating their time and air efforts to clean up our growth sites, but that's what's occurring. And this is what we basically seek to have, to leave the forest back into the position that it was before the cultivators actually affected it. Finally, what are the future visions and steps? What we see is support for more scientific documentation. So folks may have heard of a scientist sitting up on the stage saying, we need more money. But that's what happens. We, this is an emerging threat with little to no data that has been generated before until these last three years. We also need to know, are we leaving a legacy effect with the historical sites? And then also for cleanup, 10 to 20% of growth sites are cleaned up because of a lack of support and funding. We should have that at a 100% rate. Then finally, this should not be an enforcement burden. This is a conservation burden because this impacts not just the wildlife, but also us. And we should be there to conserve this, not just for the wildlife species, but also for us, our generation, and future generations. So with that, thank you.